Welcome to the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, presenting Sights and Sounds Visual Poetry. I'm Erin Donovan, associate with the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thank you for joining us. A couple of notes before we begin. Please share your questions for the authors using the Q&A tab on Zoom. This event has optional closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with a tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope that you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org slash give. Thank you to our bookseller for this event, Fountain Bookstore. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Kevin McFadden. Kevin is the author of the poetry collection, Hard Scrabble, and the chapbook, City of Dante, a collaboration with illustrator, Jeff Pike. He's a letterpress printer and chief operating officer at Virginia Humanities. Kevin, over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to have a chance to facilitate this conversation about poetry today uh, in ways that three exciting poets are interacting with what uh, one of our readers uh, today will call a transsensory experience. I hope that is what we're all here for. Uh, and so as I prepare everyone for this reading, uh, I anticipate it's gonna be multimodal in ways that transcend any one of our poetry senses, multimedia, and as much as technology allows us today to do. Uh, and we hope that means getting all three poets here. Uh, we're having a little technical ability with one, so cross fingers that we will we will all get here. Uh, and as multicultural as this rich and talented assortment of poets will allow us to be. Um, so I say to all boundaries and borders, gates and gatekeepers, be ready for these poets uh, because you can't contain them and the page certainly can't. We'll start with David Campos, author of American Quasar, who is the son of Mexican immigrants, a Canto Mundo fellow, and his collection, Furious Dusk, won the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. His work has appeared in the American Poetry Review, Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, and the Normal School. I will fade into the background and David will take it. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm very excited to kick off this event. Um, and let's see, the images. Coming right up. Perfect. So as soon as those images come on, they are assorted in a PowerPoint. So hopefully you'll get to see each and every one of the images uh, provided in the book. Um, they are not necessarily an acrostic uh, experience. And so what that means, if you're unfamiliar with that, uh, with that terminology, is that they're not made for one particular poem. Instead, both the artist and myself decided to attack uh, the creative aspect and the generation of this artwork and the poetry through this idea. We both we're like, okay, let's kind of gather ourselves around one particular idea and see where we can go with it. And that idea was a line from my first book, from Furious Dusk, which was on the precipice of violence. And we both generated work, shared with it, shared with shared it with one another um, along the process, and talked more about our process of generating the work than anything else. And so what you see and what you will hear is that culmination of that project. <clears throat> now, while the first drafts uh, of this were created in 2016, 2017 of my poems, the paintings have remained the same since. Since then, like my, the poems have evolved, have gone through many different revisions, but at the end of the day, for some strange reason, right, because we were still focused around that, that center controlling idea, they still worked with one another. Um, and the ending result 
was this book, this collection, American Quasar. And from it, I will read the opening poem, American House Fire. In a house fire, you don't die from the flames. So don't mind the broken windows. I'm trying to let the smoke out. I have been for a long time running from room to room, looking for an exit. What I would give for the chill of starlight to believe in a just God who brings rain to temper the blaze ravaging my house, to feel for once, what it's like to win. In victory, instinct orders our arms to rise toward the heavens. Some say this is what we're left with to remind us of God, to remind us to surrender. But the smoke has stolen too many of our fathers. It's after our sons. And every door leads to another dead dreams room. Still they watch my house burn, smoke lifting its arms over the city. Only if they didn't cook with fire, they say. Only if their house had followed code. How many more doors will have to burn until it's yours? I'm running out of windows. And my arms are losing their strength. The sky darkens with victory. Surrender. It's hard to tell anymore, but what's certain is in a house fire, you die when you cry your child's name. Now, one of these images that you'll see come across is actually a portrait of me that the artist did, um, I had no idea. And so when I went to visit him, um, <clears throat> when I went to visit him and he was just like, hey, so which one is your favorite? And I pointed out, oh, I really like this, this, this painting that you did of somebody. Um, and that, that particular image apparently is me with like my face being erased right, being washed off. Um, I had no idea that's <laughs> that it was me the entire time. And uh, uh, he said he's gonna send it to me <laughs> at some point. Um, but this one is American Boy. I dream myself young, running to a door, the sky's color. I'm white. Instead of myself, I wonder where all the blues went. They're not in the broken record player. The needle only plays songs of crushed bone. I want to call out the sky's real name. Even though my tongue has been sanded down from years of hushing my own. And I can't shake that tongueless boy knowing I will never grasp how to love myself in color. And so there are some things that you will notice within the images. Some of the images uh, were created, and this was really interesting, um, they're screen prints. And so he has to like work with the paint and because he just like spilled all this black ink onto um, these, the, these plates, he had to like carve out. So that's what he was doing. Right. So it's all black ink and all the white spaces are carved out. And he had to do this very, very quickly before some of the paint dried. Now, um, something that I didn't know about the process was that sometimes on these plates, um, if you reuse them, you'll get like a very ghost like image. Like in this one, there's a slight bit of a ghost like image in the background. So sometimes he would do the same image, slightly different, um, or use the same plates on different ones. And you'll see very carefully underneath um, 
the remnants of a previous image. And that was something that was part of the process. And so I tried to translate that um, in different poems by using the same structure, maybe same topic. For example, this, this specific image is exactly that. This was a face um, and then it was, I think, layered a few times um, <clears throat> to get to a different point. But I use that kind of process to generate similar poems. And so I just read American Boy, and this one is American Boy 2. I've stopped dreaming, thankfully, and I have opened my eyes. I am color. I am sure everything is a box of crayons. The blues live here. Inside this body of drums, the needle is my tongue. I remember my name and want to call out that beautiful color, that one that hid between vineyard and whiskey for years. I'm overwhelmed with vows, their hues. I lick my fingers, my lips. The sky adores me. So one of the things that he was talking about in his process of generating this art was this kind of this digging process, which this 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 image specifically is is doing right right there. He's like digging through something, digging through the earth. That's the photo. That's 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 the portrait of my uh, of me. Apparently, um, he didn't really like it, and so he like brushed it away. And then he was just like, I I kind of like the image the way it is now, and so that's how it ended up. Um, on the book. Uh, so he was angry at, at, at that one. Uh, but it was all about like trying to dig through and uncover the light, right? And dig through the ink to find, to make these images. And so I, I was really thinking about an archeologist and how his process was very much similar to that process. And so this is the archeology span of the scales. It's all about which tool you choose to dig the spade, the pick, your hands have already done this before, you think, in a previous life, on a plane like this, where the earth was hard and as unforgiving as your founding fathers. When you dig, you can feel the belt of their stones pummel you into the pieces of the shame you've inherited. Sometimes violence, is necessary for it to vanish. First, it must pass through your body. And so you heal your fathers with your disobedience and your acceptance of their dying embers in your palms. This is how you discover how perfect your hands are for digging beyond them and yourself to find all the buried stars inside the earth. When you're almost nothing but spirit and love, you'll set them free like fireflies twinkling their sighs of relief. I think two more poems and that can round it out. Um, so I, I teach at a community college um, and I've always taught poetry classes and I've taught poetry classes in, in a wide, wide range of, uh, of levels. And so one, one of the conversations I always love is, you know, you know, is that what the writer really means? And so uh, I kind of had that and I wanted to get a little meta with that, with this particular poem called In the House of Libra. One. The poet writes, a bird will always fly into your window and break its neck because sometimes guillotines are as clear as sky. Two, the student writes, the bird is a speaker, the window is his father, 
the guillotine is his father leaving. The breaking of the neck is a metaphor for his emotional response. Three, the poet responds to the student. I used to live in an apartment with a floor to ceiling window with my desk pushed up against the glass. Every now and then I would hear the thud of a body slam and fall onto the wood chips for the cats. Four, the father responds to the student and the poet. My love has always been the bird. And I was gonna read a slightly longer one, but I think to close us out, I'll use this very short one um, called Years Later. I've telescoped the light of myself. The body speaks in star language. It's music on the verge of supernova. But I'm learning to touch from the stars those who've suffered the Big Bang. Each night, a lesson on how life happens. Now, each touch of the body, a reach into potential grief. Each curve, a signal from the undiscovered dark. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening. And speaking of stars, I hope you're all keeping up with the James Webb Telescope. Thank you, David. So powerful. I'm glad we got the images working there for you. Uh, they mean so much to the work as it's coming together. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, at the Q&A session. I invite everybody, if you have uh, questions to ask for any of our poets, do put them in the Q&A. And uh, next we'll come to uh, Naoko Fujimoto, uh, who is the author of Glyph. She was born and raised in Nagoya, Japan, and studied at Nanzan Junior College. She was an exchange student and received a BA and MA from Indiana University. Her poetry collection, Where I Was Born, won the Editor's Choice by Willow Books. There we go. Thank you so much for introducing me, Kevin. Also, Kevin, uh, today uh, he will help me to show my graphic poems. And then I, I was so excited to read two wonderful fellow poets and just to start reading their books. They are wonderful. So thank you so much for having me today. So I, I write war poems because all my grandparents experienced World War II. One of my grandfather worked close to Hiroshima and he witnessed the aftermath of atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And my the other grandfather was in China, so he saw conflicts between Chinese and Japanese people. So growing up in Japan, all my grandparents taught me, educate me about wars and how important to keep pieces. Though my very first time to realize the war breaks up my community and friendship was in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. I was in college. I was a college student and I have a very good friend from Russia and Georgia. And three of us always get together and share the dinner and afternoon tea. However, when, when Russia invaded Georgia, our gathering was slowly faded up uh, and so does did our friendship. So it was my very first time to realize how war uh, broke off my community and our communities. So the first poem is not a graphic poem, but I wrote it in 2008, right after when uh, Russia invaded Georgia. Pianist. Ravel composed the music for his friends who died in World War I. A pianist hums the phrase and whispers to me, funerals 2,000 times. Home, pieces of blocks under the soldier's boots. In her smallest country, Georgia, refugee other people call her. 
Where are the, all the caskets? I ask her. All the corpses are hidden, the border, like spring water blood. A withered garbage on the piano. There is no graveyard for prayer. She cannot cry in front of it. I say, I brought a cup of tea and blueberries. She cradles the warm cup and picks up a blueberry. It lightly rolls down the table to the floor. The cat plays with a cricket, pulling off its leg. Thank you. So today, the next three poems are graphic poems from my uh, book collection, Griff Graphic Poetry called Transsensory. It was just out from Tipro Press last year. So I decided to read more poems today. Uh, the reason why I recently had a chance to talk to a very young boy, and he asked me about current war situation between Ukraine and Russia. And so we, we studied Russian culture and history and Ukraine culture and history, Cold War, and ended, ended up learning Japanese history around 1945. So Japan, Japan is a small country and it's an island country. So we are hugely depend on importing materials from all over the countries. So when I say that, so this young boy asked me, why does not Japan to secure properties outside of the island to have extra oil, food materials? He innocently ask, asked me, but this question actually really shocked me because if you know the history, Japan invaded Asia and that caused tremendous tragedy. And still we have a conflict in political relationship and the friendship. So this question really surprised me, but at the same time I realized it is too easy to fall into the same circle of a process of thinking. So I decided to read three war poems today, hoping to, to stop this uh, thinking process that Japan once made a mistake. So uh, Kevin, could you show the uh, first graphic poem, please? Will do. Yes. Grandfather held a gun. His boots was sopping wet. Rain and bread pummeled the mud hedge. Fellow Japanese dragged their paralyzed legs. Their hands smelled of no human. Bodies smoldered from toes to fingers. More dry wood, the commander said, rolled them over with a long pole, eyes glared. When grandfather wiped his eyes, the commander smacked his face. Listen, grandfather said. Goro Inuka is the name. Punch him in the nose. Could you show the second graphic poem, please? Every Thursday, mother cleans gra grandfather's apartment. She picks up a photo documentary, Auschwitz, a heavy, dusty book, she calls it. I ask her, will I go to war? Holding a vacuum cleaner, she says, I warn your pain. In the smallest room, sister cries her growing teeth. Grandfather watches TV on the harvest podium, the howling wind. He lost his voice 17 years ago, stroke. This mouth and the quietness like the people in those black and white pictures. Piles of Jewish clothes, glasses and hair, half naked bodies and holes in the ground. 
their stark tongues with the dirt in their mouths. Alas, the world adheres to their throats. After the atomic bomb in Hiroshima, grandfather stood alone on a black hill. He saw nothing but smoke, burnt skin hanging from arms. Under the august sky, his mother listened to an imperial speech from a radio. Japan was lost, mud beneath her fingernails. Miles away from home, he listened to that speech. A stranger gave him a towel, a white towel. He wiped his face. It smelled like dandelion's mother's hands. Could you show that uh, last graphic poem, please? Thank you. Dividing. Grandfather met a pregnant woman, summer 1945. She held an empty bottle and a little red kimono and sat down by a fence. He gave her water and kept walking to the hill near Hiroshima and then breaths rained and bombed. He found her again, a shred of red cloth, her bowels and placenta spread under the fence in a ditch. He did not find her unborn child, but smelled it. How beautiful the spring of 1946 was, dandelions and clovers cover the fence. Millions of cells divide in amniotic bubbles. A new heart pumps in my womb. And you ask, do we give it a Japanese or American name? Does not matter. I will stroke its forehead every night, humming an old lullaby. Thank you so much for listening to my poems and the graphic poems. Back to you, Kevin. Thank you, Naoko. What a performance and what powerful uh, family stories, images, and, and thank you for calling to mind where we are in, in, in the world right now. Um, I understand Ariel Marie has, has joined us. I'm very glad to hear that. We were having a few technical difficulties, but we'll have our third reader. Ariel Marie is the author of Gumbo Yaya, winner of the 2020 Kavi Kanem Poetry Prize as selected by Douglas Kearney. Uh, it, she is a 2019 Plowshares Emerging Writer Award recipient and has received invitations to fellowships from many literary institutions, including Lambda Literary, Vona Voices, and Tin House. Aurea. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kevin. And thank you to the Virginia Festival of the Book for having me. Um, and it's been such a treat listening to and watching the work of my um, peers on the panel, your uh, work is brilliant. So I'm really glad to be joining you today. Um, I'm gonna read a few poems uh, from my collection, Gamboyaya, and um, you know, on any other day, I might pretend to have remembered what poems I sent you, Kevin, but I'm gonna know as soon is, as- Is Georgia up. me? Is <laughs> there that, we go. All right, that rings a bell. All right. I was like, I. I know I sent them, I'm just not sure what they are. 
Okay, so um, these poems are essentially about uh, an amalgamation of things, mostly about my experience growing up as a queer and genderqueer um, Black person in the South, particularly in Atlanta, um, Georgia, which is where I'm born and raised. Um, and um, some of the content confronts gender and um, interpersonal violence, as well as state violence and um, a host of things. So we'll just get into it. Georgia me. Oh, blood mud, ground made rust with the iron of us. Oh, foggy symmetric, cataract sky oh kinky margins displaced by humidity oh the tricky algorithm animal and wound oh sunday dresses stained by christ his good marrow oh the young grass oh baptize me ruin me oh cool cerulean clean oh praise river O oh, sovereign dew oh made whole and then whole again O oh, sun gone sermons, O oh, morning, O oh, praise, O oh, custom teas, O oh, last rites, O oh, embalmed smile, O oh, memory, O oh, memory fading behind the knees at dusk, O oh, kisses in empty chapels, mouth upon mouth in the lap of God, O oh, God. Oh yes, silk hands tethered and shag carpet frisk. Oh pleasure, Bama boys, not worth they mama's labor. Oh playing grown in children's church. Oh generation of eager worship, one after another falling in love with a false God. Oh broken curses of the family name. Oh family name, oh lion, oh Israel. O oh, Spaniard, bastard, indigenous, dark, O oh, gumbo, O oh, mass scraps, made harvest, O oh, survival, 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 and only a few scars, O oh, pot deeper than a grandmother's prayer, O oh, prayer, O oh, black magic, O oh, slurped marrow, O oh, rooster feather, reed and bones, brick dust, Rose hip, indigo, cayenne, high john, root, oh root, oh the work of conquerors, oh whistle bullet, oh ghost tomb, oh hollow saunter in and out the gospel, oh holy, holy, oh holy, oh holy, oh Georgia me, fast girl in a too slow town, too heavy for the air, too free. Thank you. Um, I think I love I love all the different, you know, sort of like ways that we've chosen to display our work and have it move across the page or have it accompanied by um, image and just to create depth. Um, I think in this book, there are a lot of um, times that I use um, the, the work or the way that the work shows up on the page as a way of communicating um, urgency or creating some um, tension or friction, um, sometimes between myself and the reader, sometimes between um, the, the sort of um, the content and um, who I assume um, is kind of coming to the page to read. So um, it's, it, it's, a bit of a, of a of a gumbo itself, um, the way that the work shows up across um, across the page in this book. So, um, at that, I'm going to start in the middle um, of a of a poem. It's kind of it's the title poem of the book. It's called Gumbo Yaya, yeah. um, and it's also um, unfortunately, you know, time constraints. I couldn't read the whole thing because it's about a thousand pages long um but you know the good news is if you hate it you don't have to hear the whole thing and if you love it you can go get the book and read it um and tell me what you think so i feel like this is still a win-win even though i'm kind of throwing you into the middle of it all 
All right. And hear the proof. My mother sings of caged birds and is one no longer. My father weeps at the sight of a bruise. My brother is dead, but talks just the same. The youngest has found his head and again, his body. We're just worried that it won't translate. It's so wrong, she said. Think about all the times you're at home, sitting on the couch, watching Netflix, and you heard something. It could have been anybody. She wasn't doing anything wrong. I can't even say wrong place, wrong time because she was in her house. Every time I shrink away, I become a knife spinning open our wounds. The opposite of flying is death. The opposite of falling is death. The opposite of death is a skin knee and only a skin knee. Oh, summer, oh, summer, I claim the swollen air and I am denied. I bury my young pulpy brothers in a blanket and kiss them goodbye, even with a clear heaven over my head. Even as the sun bears upon us her brilliant mouth, I imagine, I imagine this is why Tamir Mama, Tamir Mama cries, her disbelief slick in its torrents, a hand raised toward the window, a suspicion that God was laughing. I mean, gumbo yaya. I mean, no soup for your mouth, but sustenance in a new world. I mean, take from me my breath, but never my audacity. I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't die. I said, we don't die. We just multiply, 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 multiply. We just multiply, we multiply, 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 and multiply again. Gumbo, ya, ya, and I do mean whatever the fuck a body does, dancing into a void, a joyful noise, a mournful smile, a body slack or slicken at the opposite of a line, break tradition and become become the whole black dirt beneath my nail a sound so smooth it's harlem it's an island off the coast of the carolinas it's christmas i'm holy this here a freedom song and i know not why a cage would ever say my name this here a freedom song and i know i know not why a cage would ever sing my name this here is a freedom song i know not why a cage would ever sing why a cage would ever, why a cage would ever sing my name, sing my name, sing my name, sing my name, would ever sing my name, would ever sing my name, multiply, would ever sing my name, multiply, would ever sing my name again and again, my name multiply, my name multiply, my name multiply, my name multiply, sing my name. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh, all right. I'm not running behind. Usually I'm pretty chatty, so I got a little worried. Um, so yeah. So I think there I was. Um, in the in the full poem, um, Gumbo Yaya is kind of dealing with like the intersections of our identities to throw a little language out. Um, and this idea that, um, you know, it's gumbo is a soup that is a tradition of my, there we go, a tradition of, of uh, my um, Creole background. And it's uh, kind of like everything in the kitchen goes into the pot and it, there's this feast that happens on the other side. And so that poem kind of deals with um, the multiple sort of sometimes clashing and conflicting realities of living as a black woman as a black queer person um, particularly in the south um we've got one more that kind of delves deeper into that um that uh, theme and i think this is um kevin is this my last one uh, you also had war strategies on tap, and I think we have some. Oh, okay, well, let me hear you. <laughs> Thanks. All right, this is Girl Gospel 2 Marigold. Okay, yeah, I got some cheddar chompers. So what? 
I'm yuck mouthed, but I smell good. I love me until the very tooth of the thing. My crooked, crooked mouth of daffodil enamel. School buses biting the half of a yellow sun. Yeah, yellow. And I guess I still sing because I am a bird or perhaps it's God. My eye rests upon my own self clocking. I be as sure as the second hand. Me, a metronome, and I masturbate in my mother's heels. Laugh the print of my thumb into my softest full parts. Ooh, I love me so dangerous. I could live forever like this here, a hazard in heels, na naked and sprawled, wet with sin, black as in what it mean to touch a belly and rejoice. Oh God, oh me, Oh yes, damn I'm slick. Damn I spill the thick of me and it is not blood. I say it as many times as I see fit. Oh, the possibilities of being ego. Thank you for giving a poet something to hunger after, a place to kick off her shoes. I protest in the tradition of fugitive poetics, my hand holding tight my other hand between my thighs. Yes, this here is a freedom song. I know not why a caged bird would ever sing my name. All right. I'd love to banter some more, but this is a long poem and I don't want to run over time. So I hope that you like this, these poems. And um, I appreciate you all again having me here. Uh, this is War Strategies for Every Hood. It's after uh, a young woman named Dejira Becton. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Dejira Becton is a teenager who grew up in Texas. Um, and was um, uh, unfortunately choked by a police officer um, using her own hair. Um, so this is a poem for her. War strategies for every hood. There we were laughing cause we thought there was nothing left for them to steal. They came back anyway, to take even the mortar, I guess. The creased sundresses on Lowry Boulevard, our bean pies and turmeric milk. The fish trees opening their blossomed mouths on MLK, for MLK even, for Morris Brown and the Dome for tennis courts on Washington, for Jazz Fest in Auburn, or the tiny dance floor at the department store, them virgin mojitos, one fine ass DJ snuck us when we were too young to know better and he old enough to notice. Someone stole our grandmother's laundry carts and charged us to rent them back by the hour and every hour they bombed another neighborhood, gave it leftover letters from places they ruined. So mad, we ho, Westmar. They came for the AUC, unearthed bricks lining our streets like coppered, copper bullets. They came to drive the corner preachers over county lines, the prostitutes too. And when our daughters left the house, they returned to us soaking wet rows of hair missing from their young scalps, backs purpled by the knees of policemen. Not long before now, what little they allowed us learn, we learn. Whatever corner they gave us for us, we kept for us, stayed among the borders they drew round our bodies and swaddled our babies in red ink. Now what? They come bringing shiplap and measuring tape. They fill our mouths with salt water, our pools with teeth. They come to turn our wound, our wounds into deeds, our profit, our rubble to profit, and they did. And now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? And now what? Now what? Now what? Now what? The night after our evictions, we were no more than petty cash offers, liens, dethroned ghetto kings, our delicate empires gutted by quiet legislation, a condition of battle, they called it, precautionary measures. We do what little we have left to do then, slit the braids from our scalps, 20 inches at a time, whittle our nails into daggers and march.
We lure policemen into narrow alleyways and from behind them rope our hair from our fists onto their necks, a condition of battle, precautionary measures. From out our homes, flood their pleading faces, gentrifiers bartering for mercy with China from our mother's closets. But we wore blood now, cashed our mortgages in for machetes and cankle on. Our braid lynch cords slip into loops around their necks, hold taut for small eternities, and finally let slack over and a condition of battle, over and precautionary measures, over and a condition of battle, over and over. For our niggas, our mothers, our hoods, we sang. For our daughters, our daughters, our daughters. Thank you, everyone. Great reading. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, and let's let's bring everyone back. Uh, we're going to need a little pause and some space on the page. Um, right here for a moment as we gather ourselves. I'll remind everyone. Uh, we've got a Q&A, so if you have questions, comments, things to share, I'll, I'll kind of look at those and, and bring them forward. I've got a few for everybody. First of all, thank you, all of you, for bringing it today. You really did. Uh, we knew this would be, as we said, we'd be transgressing boundaries and expectations for what we see as poetry on the page. Sometimes that's, that's what people expect. These are lines in a book. And all of you have done something in your work that, that frustrated or transgressed that expectation. And I want to talk about that. Um, and maybe I'll start with David, uh, because one of the expectations people come at a book like yours, and I've got it right here, American Quasar, everybody, uh, is they see that combination of sort of poem and an image, and they think, ah, these are ekphrastic. This is obviously... This poem is telling me something about what's there, or sometimes I think the opposite, that it's, you know, the, the collaboration went in a different way. But you told me that's that's not really how this one worked. And as you shared, could you share a little bit more about the collaboration with Maceo Montoya? And I think the phrase you used for me was the precipice of violence. Right. So, I mean, that 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 came from the first book. So uh, it's this one right here. Um, that's also his painting on my first book. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where that relationship uh, began, right? About like using his work and, and, and my work together. And originally we just wanted to create one screen print to like fundraise for the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. Um, and so we started to think about like, we absolutely did not want to do an ekphrastic exercise. Uh, we did not want to do something that was you know, already done. We wanted to push something a bit further. And so what we thought was, okay, let's come together on a specific line, on a specific idea, and then work separately and then kind of share throughout the process, right? Um, and the first thing was like, all right, the precipice of violence. And along the way, he's just like, hey, David, can you send me a photo of you punching the ground, right? And I'm like, okay sure right it's so uh that turned out to be one of the images that he used right um and he sent me the first kind of uh batch of paintings which was i believe seven and i sent him the first batch of 10 pages of poetry and then we really started to have a conversation about the process of generating that work and that's where really this idea of carving out right like really digging through some of the things because some of the first drafts were one single one single poem was like pages long right and so essentially through the editing process i was kind of like digging for the meat and he was also like through his art process digging through the ink to find the image and he had to do it very quickly just like I was generating very quickly, because if not, the ink dries uh, uh, on that plate or on the screen. And so that's kind of how that process evolved over time, right? It was just like back and forth, back and forth, talking about ideas, talking about our process. Um, 
sometimes the, the poems and the work just meld really well. Sometimes they exist there and, and, and you wonder how they work together, but they, they somehow still do. Great. And, and Naoko, we've got a question uh, from Kelly Sue uh, about the graphics that you utilized in your uh, poems. Did you make any of them? Are they things you find? And what is what? how do you do the assemblage you do? Okay, thank you, Kelly, for the question. So uh, all my graphic poems, they are all my poems, my original poems. So I'll show you like written format is just a regular poetry book. So I started graphic poetry uh, project since 2016. The 2016, there's are not many visual graphic poets. They are especially for uh, Asian women, also uh, English as a second language. I'm originally from Japan and I came here to study English and creative writing at the Indian University of South Bend. So uh, as an example of, of uh, uh, my creative process, so that one poem that I read today, this poem. Original poem is actually long. These two, two pages poems. And I translate it into text and image to create graphic poems. And in, if you see, this uh, book is brilliant. That I'm not saying because of my book. Uh, <laughs> Tipro Press hired extremely um, high standard, very famous photographer to take all my corrections. So if you see very closely, you can see all the materials. So this is a towel, towel from my grandmother's mm. house. And some of them, some of the images, it's a collage. It's a multiple layers of the papers. So uh, that's is the, my translation part which is a transsensory, translate and transport. So I hope my uh, audience transport uh, their feeling beyond of the poem and the uh, 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 little narrative beyond of the uh, more physical contentment. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ariel, I wanted to come to you. Um, partly as a comment on, so many strategies that go on in the presentation of, of your work. I know when we talk about a page and all these, these contextual rules that the page have, including rule, we wrote on ruled paper in school, there are margins. And uh, in Gumbo Yaya, you just take that all on. So I wanna hear about that. And I know some other people are, are, are wondering, how does that uh, dramatize some of the 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 context and content of, of your work um i i think i such a great question i i don't know if i'm the best person to answer that because <laughs> i of course the writer has their own intentions and then the impact upon the reader is you know uh, it varies from person to person but i think for me you know i love breaking rules i really <laughs> love um i'm like what is the rule Great. Now that I've got it, how many ways can I break it? It shows. Um, it shows. <laughs> yeah. So I think for some of the, you know, I think about uh, writing, uh, especially when I'm writing poetry, like how to communicate my voice as clearly as I can without a reader like hearing me read the poem. Um, I think that comes from being a part of slam poetry. Mm -hmm. um, as my first introduction to poems, um, you, you know, the stage is dramatic. It's, you know, there's there's levels, there's, you know, you can change the tone, you can change the volume, but it, there's just so much dynamism built into, you know, a, a poetry performance, um, especially in slam. And, you know, that flattens when you get to the page. Um, and there's other there's other levels of dynamism, but it's really hard to flex tone or volume without breaking a couple of line rules. <laughs> so um, I think for me, if there's, you know, if there was intensity that I wanted to communicate, if, you know, there, I, I wrote this for uh, 
black girls, black gender, queer people, people from the South. And that's a frame of reference and that's a context that's you know important to have, but I wanted to be able to reach out to a reader who might not be from any of those backgrounds or from any of those intersections and create the same or similar stakes. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I thought to do that was layering um, was different fonts, different sizes of fonts. Um, you, you saw at the end of, of Gumbo Yaya where the poem, uh, the words swell and the poem goes on, but then you've got this sort of like swelling storm of a couple of different phrases that just kind of bubbles over um, across the page. And I think that that, uh, it might confuse a reader, <laughs> I hope not, but I think what it also does is that especially after the first read or the second read, it creates some some context and um, creates a similar amount of stakes that. Um, yeah, and it's uh, almost like sheet music. It sort of teaches you how to perform that that yeah. piece of work. It, it it asks you to to interpret it. Yeah. Uh, what about the the decision to spell girl? Could you say more about how you do that? Yeah, uh, I identify as gender queer. Um, it's a part of one of my many identities, um, and I you know, use she, her pronouns, but I also use they and them pronouns and um, was raised as a black girl in the South. And that comes with a whole bunch of gendered expectations and sort of, um, you know, conflicts. One of them being, I was never allowed to play outside and get my clothes dirty. My brothers, <laughs> they could be outside until the streetlights came on and I couldn't. And, you know, that's that's something simple, but um, there's a there, there are a lot of different, um, lived experiences that, you know, we were taught as, uh, as people who were, you know, raised as young women. And um, my, my, my gender identity doesn't necessarily, in, you know, move me to divorce myself wholly from those experiences, but there is a bit of some subversion. And I think the ex helped me um, communicate some sort of subversion was happening. And I, and I left it up to the reader to sort of investigate that to kind of figure out, um, you know, if that meant anything or to just be questioning, um, cause that's, that's one of the cues in LGBTQ anyway, questioning. So it, it was, it was just to give, uh, the reader sort of an indication that there was something afoot. That's great. And yeah. when it comes up in Scrabble now, I'm playing it. Yeah, you should. And, <laughs> and there's, there's, you know, I, I will come and I'll, and I'll argue on your behalf. Oh, good. All right. I'll need you. You're my call. I'll phone a friend. Phone a friend. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, a, a question for Naoko. What's the physical scale of some of those visual pieces that you're making? Someone was curious how, how about how big? It's actually pretty big than people think. People think probably like, like this is, you know, a book and like this size. This is another cover of a graphic poem, but it's actually, you can see just art behind me bigger than this. So graphic poem is actually large. Yeah. Great. And we're running near our time and I just want, I'll throw one big one out for everybody, but focus, I know poets can on a, on, on a compressed answer. Uh, obviously you're all word people, but I'm so impressed with the ways you're, you're seeking out other ways to do this. And I'm curious in terms of what have, what have you learned from sort of that, the limits of words and what your decisions kind of for these books have taught you and maybe what you might want to do next. Uh, David, can I jump Quickly, to there are really no limits I've discovered and that, um learn like some good adobe stuff on the way right like <laughs> i'm learning a uh, 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 designer right now so i can so i can explore a little bit more great yeah go, I learned it. Oh, excuse me. go ahead i learned uh, uh we don't need any permission to create art so i am from japan and I always ask the people, can I write in English? Can I write, you know, creative writing in English? English is not my language, but there's a no permission for it. If you feel, you know, to do something in you, I think go for it. That was I learned from creating a graphic poems. Great. David, when you figure out designer, can you please teach me? 
<laughs> because even finishing this book, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how that happened or in design, it, right? It's so hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, I learned um, other than, you know, there are people who professionally specialize in design for a reason. <laughs> I learned that um, I think uh, we have our own biases, our own poetic biases and impulses about what a line can or can't do and what the rules are and what's a sacred rule versus what's, you know, one of the throwaways that you like pick up in English class and then you leave it alone when you're done. And um, I think that watching what, what different poets do with their lines, what they do, you, you know, beyond the line, be like with imagery and imaging on the page can teach you about their, their value system when it comes to poetry. And that helps me learn more about other poets and, 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 and learn the, the world and the horizon of poetry, which is really exciting. I watch for the breaks even more now and the little, the little rule breaking, which is really exciting for me. There's another great question out there. It's too great to, to get to. Maybe we'll come back to the, the question or, and I'll have you all think about it representing music on the page. I think you're already doing it in the words you're choosing and, and some of those decisions and visual decisions. So I, I just wanna applaud everybody and say thank you for the gift of these books. And for everyone out there who's watching, uh, be sure, find your independent bookstore or wherever you like to get books and uh, pick these up. Remember Fountain Bookstore. I think we're gonna put out a, a, a link there for everybody. Uh, there's a 20% discount on getting these books. Thank you, Found Bookstore. That's a very easy incentive for a day like today. Um, thank you all for, for, for doing such a great job today, uh, performing for us uh, and inspiring us with, uh, with your work. Thank you so much, Kevin and everyone. And, and thank, thank you, Nyako and, and David, too. All right. Have a fun festival, everybody. See you out there. Thank you. Bye.